Riv, how's it going? My name's TJ, I'm the student ministry director here at Riv. Uh, Excited to be with you today. Obviously, um, man, this has been a crazy season for our church and for all of our ministries, really. Uh, But for the student ministry, it definitely has posed some unique challenges in how do we invest in the lives of kids, of high schoolers and middle schoolers in our church. And so we've done the best we can all summer to be as present as we can and as safe as we can outside in life groups in RIV communities, doing everything we knew how to do. And just as of late, we began uh, being able to meet in the chapel of the church. And so 50 people or less, uh, socially distanced, masks, sanitizer everywhere. It's just a good time, right? Um, And I gotta tell you that it's been really reviving for our souls and for our ministries. And so we'd love for your student, if you have a seventh or an eighth grader or a high schooler uh, to be involved. And so if you have one of those kids or or you know somebody, uh, you can get a hold of, of our team at element at rivchurch.com or chaos at rivchurch.com, depending on if you're a middle schooler or a high schooler. And we'd love to get you connected. I'd love to meet with you. I'd love to see you. Um, and so uh, with that, I would love to introduce one of my friends, Jenny Cole, the Riv Kids director, who's going to be sharing with us uh, the scripture reading for today. Hey, good morning, Riv. My name is Jenny, and I'm on staff with the Riv Kids team. My family and I attend the whole venue. Today's scripture reading is Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think, any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. There will be an affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For there is no favoritism with God. Awesome. This is a time in our service when we're going to enter into a time of of worshiping through song. So I'd love to introduce you to my friend Scott and and band leader, really. Uh, What's up, Scott? Hey, TJ. Uh, Yeah, like you said, I'm Scott. Uh, Our band is called uh, Adam and the Naming Convention. This is Dewan on cello and Jenny on vocals. Uh, Our first song is going to be The Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Uh, And the reason I chose that, we chose that, uh, is because Noel's message is uh, heavily themed uh, with grace. And so not only this song, but the uh, other two songs that we're going to be doing today are uh, fully centered around that theme as well. That's awesome, man. Well, can't wait to worship with you, so. Yeah, great. Um, So I first wanted to uh, just read a scripture uh, from Colossians 3.16 that says, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So with that, um, I just wanted to invite everyone to worship uh, in their homes and uh, whether you're with your life group or, or with friends or just with your family, um, I just want to encourage you. I know that we've been doing this for six months now, um, but uh, just worshiping in your homes just doesn't have, uh, it's not as easy as, as uh, singing with the congregation and with the body of Christ. So um, I would just encourage each and every one of you to uh, maybe turn up your TV, turn up your laptop uh, and sing loud with the people that you're with um, and really just give your, your praise to God. The wonderful grace of Jesus Greater than all my sin How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden Setting my spirit free The wonderful grace 
grace of Jesus reaches me. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. More patient than my fight, more faithful than my doubt. Persistent though I run, how is grace abound? Brought it in my sin, deeper than my shame, stronger than my evil. Oh, praise Jesus' name. grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled by its transforming power making him God's dear child purchasing peace in heaven for all eternity the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me more patient than my fight more faithful than my doubt persistent though I run how is grace abounds? Brought it in my sin, deeper than my shame, stronger than my evil. Oh, praise Jesus' name. You know, I know a lot of us have been 
going through a hard time this year with, with all the extra stuff going on. I mean, whether it's anxiety we see all the time or, or just fatigue or just the sheer exhaustion from people living, working, teaching from home, all of these tough things. Um, you know, we, we, we look at all these hard things in this season and I think, man, you know, we have a ministry here at Riverview to help with these and multiple other things. It's called the Stephen Ministry. And it's just a group of people at RIV and in the RIV fam who've gone through some extensive training to listen, care, and point you or me or anyone through the truth or to the truth of the scripture in times like these. And so whether it's loneliness, stress, anxiety, some spiritual wrestling, uh, really just whatever season it is, they're trained to listen, to hear, and to help process through this season of life. This season of life, sorry. Um, and, you know, they're meeting with, with people that are Stephen Ministry right now, uh, in person, on Zoom, um, over the phone, whatever me- meets your needs best. And so there's, there's options for you. Uh, right now, I know the hardest thing is just to take the first step in opening the door to somebody helping and caring for you. Uh, but if that's something you're interested in, you can go to rivchurch.com slash live and find information um, and even point somebody in the direction to, to get information that might benefit from this um, from this ministry that we have. That's a really, really great ministry. I know some of the people that are, that are working in this and it's, man, it's so awesome. So, um, I don't know if you heard, but when Jenny was reading Romans 2, 1 through 12, one of the main things that she hit on and what the scripture's hitting on, what Noel's hitting on this week is this idea of repentance. And as I was thinking through that, I was thinking, man, you know what? Like, repentance is hard. (laughs) Why is repentance so difficult? And by repent, I mean, it's just the turning away from sin and turning towards God and his truth. It's so hard for us to do. And I just couldn't figure out why is that? And so what I think would be good for us to do and what I'm gonna do with the band over here is just take about 90 seconds and just start working through maybe having a conversation with who's ever in the room with you. Maybe it's your RIV community. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your favorite Labrador retriever. I don't know, but maybe it's a journal. If, if you're just journaling or writing or taking notes during this sermon, um, write down what are some of the difficulties? Why do you think it's so hard? hard to repent. And then after that, I think Noel will come up and, and teach a little bit on Romans 2, 1 through 11. So.
What's happening, Riv? Uh, my name is Noel. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you are just joining us for the first time today, or maybe you've gotten a little bit out of rhythm on this whole li- online church thing uh, for the last couple of weeks, and you're just jumping back in, I want to catch you up on where we are. Uh, first of all, uh, Jesus is still our Savior and King, so we're good. Uh, everything else kind of sets secondary to that. Uh, second, Um, In this kind of bonkers season in which we're living, we are encouraging people as much as possible to stay connected uh, in community somehow. Because we all need other people in our our lives, and so we're encouraging people to figure out ways uh, to connect. And what we're doing is we're calling that Riv Communities, and we're we're asking people just to be in community with other people at Riv. Uh, Some people are watching these services together with their life group, or combining life groups, or inviting some neighbors over and watching in the backyard as long as the snow is not flying. Um, And we just want to encourage you, if at all possible, find a way to engage in these services somehow uh, with other people. Thirdly, we are in a, well, the third week of a series going through the book of Romans in the New Testament. And during this series, uh, what we're encouraging people to do is to bring their Bibles with them so you can kind of follow along. And so if you have your Bible handy, uh, grab it quick. We are going to be in Romans uh, chapter 2 today, uh, which is all the way back in your Bible back here. So as, as I was attending church online with my family last week, I was reflecting on how the passage that Pastor James taught on at the end of of Romans 1 is is one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament of the Bible. And it's not difficult um, because it is somehow hard to understand. It's difficult because it's difficult to take. We just don't like the stuff that is in the end of Romans uh, 1. If you were here with us last week, you know uh, that that chapter ends uh, with one of the clearest and most damning lists of sins in the New Testament and how sin has an escalating effect on our lives and on the lives of our society. The Apostle Paul in Romans pulls like zero punches. He lumps things like like murder and inventors of evil into the same category as gossip and disobedience to parents. And he says that all of this is evidence of the sin nature that we drag along with us in our lives. And so so Paul's sweeping list of these 21 specific sins in Romans 1 has a a striking impact on us uh, because every one of us can find ourselves somewhere on his list. And just for fun, let me reread the list for you. I'm not going to put it on the screen. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. But let me reread the end of Romans 1. Paul says this, and because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do not do or they do what is not right. They are filled with all unrighteousness evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips and slanderers and God-haters and arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Although they know God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they applaud others who practice them. Now, when we read a list like this in the Bible of sins, we can have one of three responses. We've got a lot of responses, but there's at least three responses we could have. The first is to quote Kelly Kapoor uh, when she said, I have a lot of questions. Number one, how dare you? (laughs) Well, because while we are certain to not only find ourselves in this list of sin somewhere, we're also certain to find something in this list offensive. But that's the thing about Paul. That's the thing about the Bible. It doesn't tell us what we want to hear. It tells us what we need to hear. If we are unloving, 
the book of Romans says the sentence for that is death. If we cheer people on while they slander another person, the just sentence for that is death. Now, me uttering those words may cause some of you to say to me, well, how dare you, Noel? <laughs> like, how dare the Apostle Paul? How dare the Bible? How dare God? And in my experience, we often have this how dare you response if the sin in question is either a sin that we like to commit or one that we find perfectly acceptable or harmless as long as it doesn't harm another person in our minds. Now, the second response we can have to a list of sins, like the one we found in Romans 1, is a, a smug and arrogant amen. And when we do that, this response presumes a position of superiority. It's kind of like uh, the Pharisee in Jesus' parable who arrogantly proclaimed, well, God, I thank you that at least I'm not like that guy over there. And by the way, if that's your response, you actually missed yourself. You're in the list. In the middle of the 21 things uh, that he listed, he lists right here, boastful and proud. <laughs> See, you're right there. See, now the third response to this passage um, is actually in the passage that we just read. And, and by the way, we are going to do that a lot in the series. We're going to be kind of jumping back into texts that we've already covered because we're going to be moving at just slow enough of a pace through Romans that sometimes the Apostle Paul's thoughts will build from week to week and we're going to need to double back for the connective tissue, right? So this is what he said in the last verse of Romans 1. He said, although they know God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. And this is the third response that we can have. The first is to say, how dare you, God? The second is a smug amen that says, we haven't done any of these things wrong. And the third response, Paul says, are people who they, they know that what they're doing is wrong from a biblical perspective. They know that it's sin. They get it. And yet they continue to do those wrong, sinful things. Even more so, they applaud sinful behavior that they see in other people. They celebrate it. They flip what is good and what is evil. And so what the Apostle Paul does for here as we move into chapter 2 is he tells us what he hopes our reaction will be. He, he doesn't want us uh, to say, how dare you? He doesn't want us to have a smug, um, proudful, um, arrogant attitude. He doesn't want us to continue to sin in these things that we know is wrong. He tells us in Romans 2 what he is hoping our response to this list of sins will be. He says this, therefore, every Every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself since you, the judge, do the same things. Let me summarize the Apostle Paul for a second. He says, dude, are you really going to judge someone else's sin and ignore your own as if yours is no big deal? See, what Paul is hoping we will do when we hear this long list of 21 different sins is to find our sin on the list and then to kind of look around at the people around us and realize that we are all in this mess together. You see, Paul, he lists sins, he lists such an exhaustive list of sins that you would be hard pressed not to find yourself in there somewhere. I mean, let's just pick a couple out of his 21. He says that quarrelsome is a sin. Well, what does it mean to be quarrelsome? Well, uh, quarrelsome just means to be a lover of strife. <laughs> and, and most of us will say, well, I'm not a lover of strife. But a, a lover of strife, a quarrelsome person, is someone who is always enjoying picking a fight. 
they always love to be in the middle of a fight or a middle of a controversy. And here's the crazy thing. You can actually be on the side of truth, but your love for getting into the fray, your quarrelsome attitude, your love of strife can be sinful even in that truth. A quarrelsome person lives in the comments section of YouTube. They live on Twitter. They, they pounce on every tiny little infraction and inaccuracy because they love the strife and being like that is a sin. Paul says, being untrustworthy. And let's let Jesus define what untrustworthy is. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else comes from the evil one. You see what he's saying? Sometimes we say yes when we mean no. Sometimes we say yes, but then we don't show up. We don't follow through. We make a commitment and we can't be trusted to follow through on that commitment. We don't do what we said we're going to do. People count on us and we drop the ball and Paul says, this is a sin. So we've got all these sins in this category. So each one of us, we find ourselves in one of these 21 sins. What do we do? Like if we're a quarrelsome person or we're an untrustworthy person or any of the things that we consider worse on this list, what do we do? Well, Paul says it should keep us from judging others. And I was reflecting on this a lot this week. We, we have these big sins um, that we kind of point out, like the, maybe the murder is the big one for you, maybe sexual sin is the big one for you. And it's so easy for us to point our fingers at these ones and then to ignore what we consider to be a lesser sin in the list that we have. But Paul says, no, that's arrogance. That's, that's boasting. I, I love it. Jared Wilson, he's a pastor and a professor. He, he tweeted this this week. He said, the gospel explodes our moral categories. There's not good people and bad people. There's people and then there's Jesus. <laughs> And that's the good news Paul is getting at. He is like, listen, every one of you who judges is without excuse. When you judge another, you condemn yourself. Since you, the judge, do the same things. You are in the same boat with everyone else. Now, he says, we know that God's judgment on those who do such thing is based in or on the truth. Remember, Paul here is writing in the book of Romans to Christians. And he is assuming here that the Christians agree with a basic tenet of Christianity that God is, wait for it, right about stuff, <laughs> right? He's basically saying, we all know this. We all agree with this basic fundamental principle that God is right. So he is based in truth. His judgment is correct. And interestingly, this is the last time in this section that Paul uses the word we, he now pivots and he starts kind of getting into what is called a, an argument type called a diatribe. And what that is, is he's now going to start to have an argument with an imaginary opponent to build his case. Um, and so he's going to move from we language to like you language, okay? So who is this imaginary opponent? Well, there's actually a little bit of a debate about this. Um, it could be that the imaginary opponent is a typical Roman Christian, since that's who he's writing this entire letter to. Other people think that he's writing specifically at this section uh, to Jewish Christians uh, because he's about to spend a big chunk of time talking about Judaism. Um, and we can't know for sure who his, his opponent is in his mind. I think he was writing this section to Jewish Christians, but I might be wrong on that. Um, but the good thing about the diatribe style of debate is it allows us, the hearer, to place ourselves in the shoes of the person who is debating with Paul. Um, and so no matter who he thought his imaginary debate partner was, uh, we can put ourselves there and say, it's us. Uh, and so let's swing back to verse two and, and let's look at this all important assumption. He says, now we know that God's judgment on those who do such thing is based on the truth Right? So Paul is assuming, what I'm about to say, he's saying, is assuming that God is a quarter of the truth. His judgments are true. Uh, we may disagree with him. We may debate him. That doesn't make him wrong. He doesn't need our permission to be right. Right? And based on this assumption that God's judgment about sin and righteousness, all that is true, Paul now launches into his debate with us, his diatribe with us. Verse 3, he says, do you think any one of you who 
judges those who do such things, yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment. Now, that sentence should stop us dead in our tracks. It's kind of that classic whole, you know, when you point one finger at someone, you have three fingers pointed back at you, which I've never understood because when I point at someone, I'm also pointing my thumb at them, which is also a finger. But, um, but Paul here is building this, this case uh, that we're all in the same boat, right? He says, we are all sinners. There's no room for us to judge or to point or to be smug toward other people. We're all deserving of the righteous judgment of God. And so now he continues his argument. He says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. This is a remarkable statement, especially for those of us who find ourselves offended by some of the list of sins that Paul laid out last week. Because so often, our how dare you kind of posture toward God or toward the Bible, it presumes that God is some sort of cosmic killjoy uh, that gets his jollies off by condemning people, right? Um, but look at the words that Paul uses to describe God in the section. What does he say? He says, kindness. And not just kindness. What does he say? He says, the riches of his kindness. He describes God as, what does he say? He says, he has restraint and patience. Kindness, restraint, patience. Just take a minute and reflect on that in light of our sin. In light of the 21 sins that he laid out in the last chapter. In, in, in light of those sins that we find offensive. What is your idea of the posture of God towards you? His posture towards you is kindness. It's restraint. It's patience. Think about that. The, the character of someone is always shown when they're given power. We all know this, right? So when someone is, becomes the shift leader at our, our, our company or a team captain or the CEO, we, it's in those moments you kind of see who somebody really is and God has ultimate power, right? He has the power to spin creation into existence, to breathe life into humankind, to, the, the power to snuff out the sun if he wants to, to, to dream up the delicacy of butterfly wings and knit them together. That's power, right? And what does God do with his power? He's kind. He shows restraint. He's patient. God could snap his fingers and reduce you to ash the instant you sin, and yet he's kind. He shows restraint. He is patient. And he has an intent behind all that. Do you see it in this passage? In verse 4, what does it say? God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So what is repentance? Well, repentance isn't like a, oh man, I got caught, I'm sorry, sort of thing. It's not even just a kind of a tacit acknowledgement that we've done something wrong or that we've sinned. It means you're heading in this direction, and now repentance means you turn around and you now head in that direction. You, you were quarrelsome, but now you're a peacemaker who believes the best in other people. You were untrustworthy, but now people can count on you that your yes is yes and your no is no. And at, at, the, at its core, repentance is all about relationships. You see, God is kind and restrained and patient toward you. And now, as you repent from your sins, you become kind and restrained and patient toward other people. At its 
gosh, it's not even like you try to do those things. You don't gut yourself to be a more patient person, right? You can't force yourself to be kind. Uh, Christ-likeness is not something that we can just, just push onto our character and say, I'm going to be more like Jesus. It's kind of like, it's more like this. You know how like when you're driving, you tend to steer toward whatever you're looking at, right? So like you ever drive in traffic like in between all the construction, right? And you just know if you start staring at the orange barrels, you are increasing your chance of kissing one with your car, right? Um, When we repent, this is what we do. Um, Our core relationship turns from looking at ourselves. All those lists, that list of 21 things, it was all self-oriented. It's, it, we look from navel gazing, looking at ourselves, looking at our sin. Um, and the, what do, when we're quarrelsome, what are we doing? We're making it all about us. When we're untrustworthy, what are we doing? We're making it all about us. And what happens is our gaze is looking at us. But when we repent and turn, we turn our gaze from ourselves to Jesus. And in doing so, we become more like him. Our eyes drift to him. So we steer our lives more toward him. Look at verse 5. He says, because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath. When God's righteous judgment is revealed, he will repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who who by persistence in doing good seek glory and honor and immortality, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. Again, what Paul's doing here is he's building a case and he's building this case with this anonymous debate partner and the debate partner wants nothing to do with God's kindness or restraint or patience. His heart is hard and unrepentant toward God. He is gazing at the orange barrels of sin in his soul. And because of that, wrath is building up over his head and a fiery wreck is coming for this guy. And this is why for a follower of Jesus, calling sin, sin is the kindest thing that we can do. Our culture says it's not loving to call certain things sin. But if sin is truly the right judgment of God, if it truly is consequential and leads to death, and the sin uh, always has um, eternal consequences and sometimes has earthly consequences, and wrath always builds up towards sin, the kind thing to do is call sin, sin. To say, stop looking at those orange barrels. Now, there's something weird Paul says right in the middle. I don't know if you caught it. Let me reread it. Um, Back in verse 6, he said this. He said, he will repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. Now, wait. Does that mean that we can and must live perfectly? Is he saying... We must obey the law perfectly. And if we obey the law perfectly, then we'll gain eternal life. Is that what he's saying? And there's a lot of different viewpoints of what Paul is saying here. But what I think he's saying, and what I think is most consistent with the rest of his letter, including in the next chapter, when he says this, he says, there is no one righteous, no, not one, (laughs) right? Paul is saying the standard to achieve eternal life is perfection. Perfect works, a perfect life a sinless life, one that does not have any of the sinful attributes or actions described in the previous chapter. In other words, the entrance card to a life perfectly in sync with how God has designed the world, the entrance ticket to one that will lead to eternal life is not the kind of life we're leading. In fact, he continues this ramp. Verse 9, there will be affliction and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. There is no favoritism with God. So here's the case that I think Paul is building. He's saying, we must all do good. We must all be perfect and None of us are. No Jew, no Greek, no American, none of us. What that means is there is no favoritism with God. We're all on a level playing field. So what does that mean? Well, it's beautiful. 
for those of us who hear lists of sins and we become kind of arrogant and smug thinking, well, at least I'm not like that guy. We can see in the gospel that we have nothing to stand on that gives us the ability to look down on others for their sin. The gospel sets us free from our smugness. We can cut people some slack. We can forgive. We can be kind. We can be patient. We can be restrained. We can treat others with the same kindness and restraint and patience that God has shown us. And for those of us who look at lists of sin like this, and we think God is picking on us, we think, why is he calling out my particular sin? Because what happens is we do tend to see either the ones we consider to be big or the ones that we know that we're committing, and we kind of miss all the rest of it. We're like, well, why is God picking on me? The, the sin that I love to do. What we can see in the gospel is that we are in a great cloud of people who all have their sins being called out to. They're seeing a different one on the list. We're all on the list. And Jesus died for the list. He became the list. And he calls on us to turn our gaze from the orange barrels of our sin and to gaze onto him. And through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we can ever so slowly over the course of a lifetime become more like Christ. Not because we make ourselves do it, but because he has promised he will conform us into his image. And then for those of us who know what is sin, and yet we plan on doing it anyway, Jesus kindly and patiently calls on us to repent. He knows us and he knows our sin better than any of us do. And he's calling on us and saying, turn to me. There's life in me. You don't have to drive off the road into a fiery wreck of sin. Turn to me and I will give you my love and, and, and patience and kindness and forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much that, uh, that we are not alone in our sins, that we have no excuse to judge anyone because we are just as bad as they are. We thank you that we look at lists of sins in Scripture and we see ourselves. Because when we see ourselves as a sinner, we, we see ourselves as someone who needs to be saved. We see ourselves as someone who has been saved in you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his free gift of salvation. And we just pray that we would lift our eyes off of our own sin and our own sin nature and we would lift them to you. We just pray that you would do the work that only you can do, transforming us from the inside out because of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey, Riverview, I'm here with a bunch of the Riv pastors as well as some of our pastoral candidates. And we want to take a few minutes to honor Fred and Dana Choi. A number of years ago, uh, we as a church were one church in a couple locations, and we had dreams uh, of, of planting more venues, and we had some big operational needs. And so we went on the hunt to find somebody to help us with all of those needs, and we found Pastor Fred Choi and his wife on the west coast of the United States. And so so they came all the way here and have been instrumental in most of what Riverview has done over the last uh, several years, not only helping us with uh, strategic and operational initiatives and launching new venues, but even in setting the evangelistic tone and culture of our church. Uh, these folks are, are brilliant <laughs> evangelists, even hearing stories about some evangelism uh, steps that were taken yesterday uh, here in Lansing. And we wanted to take a few minutes to honor them because 
because they've made the decision to move out to Denver, Colorado to join a fantastic church out there called Fellowship Denver. It's a fellow Acts 29 church, a network that we're part of, and they are in a very similar situation to where we were when the Choice came and jumped on board with us. Uh, they're looking to launch more venues. They have some strategic and operational needs. And in a lot of ways, it's going home for the Choice um, because Denver is a place they lived when they first got married. And so we are thrilled for them, bummed for us, but that's what happens. Our mission is to proclaim the liberating power of the gospel as we grow, serve, and go. And sometimes we go. And we like to call those gospel goodbyes. They're not forever goodbyes. They're goodbyes for the sake of the gospel. And I am thrilled uh, to see what God does in Fellowship Denver uh, through the choice uh, moving out there. And so what we want to do is just take a few minutes to pray with them and for them as they get ready to launch into this new venture. We're going to start with uh, Pastor Tony and then a couple of the pastors are going to pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you today uh, for Fred and for Dana and for Elsie and for Elias. God, just for their family, their faithfulness here in the Lansing area these last eight years. And God, just personally, just grateful for their friendship, their partnership in the gospel, and just eager to see, God, what you do through them in Denver. Uh, yeah, God, again, so grateful uh, for what you've given us and them and looking forward to what they do in the future. Lord, we are so thankful for Fred and Dana. We are thankful for their faith, to take a step of faith to move across the country in the middle of a pandemic to take on a new role in a new city and we just pray as they are navigating all those changes with the newness a new environment for both them and their kids we just pray you'd give them an abundance of grace pray that they would really grow and be planted in community there in denver uh, in their neighborhood with the church pray you'd give them tremendous grace just to navigate the newness of what's going on there pray for their kids that they would find uh, new friends and that you would clearly establish permanence to the work of their hands there in Colorado, Lord. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for Fred and Dana, just the influence they've had on so many lives and people in the area here with Riverview. And we thank you for the devotion to you and to uh, the Riverview family. And uh, we ask God that as they go on to Denver, that you would uh, give them grace as they uh, open a new, a new uh, household there with new friends, new relationships, God, that you bless that, and that their impact there might might really be uh, even much more than it is here, it has been here, Lord, that you would uh, richly bless the church there, and with their gifts, their heart, their passion for people, and their passion for what's important to you. Uh, God, thank you for their time here. God, we're gonna miss them, but thank you so much for the influence they've had for the gospel here at Riverview, amen. Continuing in our response uh, to this gospel truth that we just heard, we're gonna sing a, a few more songs, but also we wanna uh, create this opportunity for, for you to give. You can give online at rivchurch.com slash give or by texting give to the number that's on your screen. So join us as we just sing a couple more songs and lift our voices up to God. This is a song that we've been doing around Riv quite a bit lately. Um, it's called Day by Day. I'm 
died when I was so far from you And now you say that I'm your friend Then you gave me hallelujah I'm my savior and my king Lift my voice hallelujah Your love is like an ocean to me Drowning my sins to the soul Your love is like an ocean to me Wave after wave, it never stops to believe Your love compared to where I was Showed everything that I had done Was dirty from the start compared with you My work, my strength, my deeds, my love Tried all my might to find sin up And failed to live the perfect life You came and did it all Your love is like an ocean Your love is like an ocean to me Wave after wave, it never stops Wave after wave Wave after wave, it never stops Wave after wave, it never stops So help me to believe Thanks for gathering together with us today uh, for the service. As I mentioned earlier, if you're looking for care in this season, whatever season uh, you're in, you can get more info about the Stephen Ministry at rivchurch.com slash live. Also, a number of other events, group happenings, and uh, online and in person to, in different capacities um, are also, there's information of those at rivchurch.com slash events. So thanks again, and we'll see you guys next week.